to say yet again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who made today a success. Uh, thank you again to Phil for arranging all of the nitty-gritty details of today. He's done an excellent job, so give it up for Phil. Uh, also, our sponsors, I do want to make sure to recognize our sponsors again. Augusta University for providing this amazing facility. Leo Cybersecurity for sponsoring lunch. Uh, Proofpoint Rural Technology Fund. No Starch Press, Dualcom, and Midbit. Please make sure that if you are on the Twitters, that you tweet out to the sponsors and say thank you. Uh, because without them, today would not have been a success. So thank you again to our sponsors. Have you had a good time today? Have you learned something new? Excellent. All right, so one thing before we get started. Mr. Chris Sanders, could I ask you to come up front? No. Yes, <laughs> right now. So uh, as many of you are well aware, Chris started this little thing called the Rural Technology Fund, which uh, donates equipment to classrooms. And this is uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart because I grew up on a little bitty dirt road. My address was a rural route. I didn't have a real mailing address like some folks do. So uh, we are very appreciative of everything that you do during and with the Rural Tech Fund. And we want to recognize you for that. So on behalf of Secure Dining Solutions and the entire Secure Dining community, we would like to present this check for $3,000 to the Rural Technology Fund. <laughs> Okay, so are you ready? Here we go. So we've heard a lot of great stuff today, and some of that great stuff came from Chris's talk, and he talked a lot about pivoting, and we're going to continue to talk about pivoting, uh, but we're going to, right now, pivot into the elastic stack. A lot of folks know this as elk. Uh, and when we did our very first technology preview of the Elastic Stack of Elasticsearch Logstash and Kibana back in uh, February-ish, uh, I very quickly was reached out to by the marketing manager of Elastic Co. saying, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please use the term Elastic Stack instead of Elk. So from here on out, you'll hear me use the term Elastic Stack. So. Uh, you see this picture here, release early and release often. This is, a, uh, this is a strategy that we are firm believers in, and you see this throughout the entire life cycle of Security Onion, and you certainly see this throughout uh, this last few months of this Elastic Stack integration. We started off back in, uh, this was in March, March the 16th. We re released the very first technology preview of the Elastic Stack on Security Onion. Very basic, uh, very simple integration just to show folks, hey, this is where we're heading. We'd love to get your feedback. Release early, release often. Incorporating that feedback, being agile, and trying to make sure that we're meeting the needs and desires of the community. Our second technology preview was released June the 2nd. Does anybody remember the big change in technology preview 2? Okay, well, we had Elasticsearch in the first technology preview. The second technology preview is when we switched to Docker. So the very first technology preview, we used kind of these standard Ubuntu packages for the Elastic Stack. In technology preview two, we moved to Docker images. Now, there's a very important reason for this, and that was that with those kind of standard Ubuntu packages, we were really kind of limited to the Elastic Stack version two because that was uh, what we could run using OpenJDK 7, which is what we have on Ubuntu 14.04. Now, the current version of the Elastic Stack is version 5, but that requires OpenJDK 8. So, therefore, in order to run the stack on Ubuntu 14.04, uh, we integrated using Docker images. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Technology Preview 3 came out July 28th, and it had some some nice improvements there, not a whole lot of earth-shattering stuff from Technology Preview 2. 
But that's kind of a brief history of where we've been this year and what we've been up to as far as integrating the Elastic Stack into Security Onion. Uh, a couple of metrics here. This has been over seven months of work. We really kind of started in February. Uh, thousands of hours put into this project and over 700 GitHub commits. Uh, we've been working quite feverishly trying to get this done as quickly as possible. Uh, and you know, this is one of those things where I knew at the beginning, once I made the decision that we were going to go with the Elastic Stack, it was going to be a lot of work. I wasn't quite sure how much work it was going to be, and I wasn't sure that it was going to be this much work, but it's a lot of work. Uh, I do want to say thank you uh, because we are very appreciative, first of all, for the fine folks at Elastic Co. for releasing the entire OpenStack as free and open source software uh, so that we can take advantage of it. Uh, I want to make a special thank you to Justin Henderson. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Justin Henderson uh, at one time ran the world's largest Security Onion deployment. Uh, anybody want to guess how many sensors he had? It's on its way to 800. It's currently over 600, possibly over 700, uh, with hopes of getting to 800. So world's largest security on your deployment. And years ago, he started moving to the Elastic Stack. Uh, and based on that, he started kind of building his own log stash configurations uh, and kind of releasing those on his GitHub repo. And that has been kind of the basis of our Elastic integration that we've been working on. So huge thanks to Justin for the work that he did there. Uh, he also built some of our Docker images, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, one of those Docker images is based on a couple of Python scripts by my good friend Mark Baggett. Mark, are you still here? Did Mark, Mark left? See, I was going to give him a shout out, and he runs out on me. What's up with that? Uh, so Mark Baggett wrote uh, some Python scripts, freakserver.py and domainstats.py. We'll talk about more about those in a minute. Uh, but those are going to be going to give us some amazing hunting capabilities. So I'm very excited to demo those for you. Uh, Wes Lambert, uh, who is now an official employee of Security Onion Solutions, as of a few months ago, he has been doing some. Yes, he's back there waving. Uh, he's been doing some amazing work on our visualizations and dashboards. So I'd say about 99.9% .9 of the visualizations and dashboards that you see. Uh, is blood, sweat, and tears from Wes Lambert. Uh, he's been working tirelessly on that. Uh, and Phil Planamira. So Phil has given uh, crazy amounts of feedback. Uh, and so when we first started talking about this way back in late last year, leading into January and starting into February, uh, we had a lot of discussions. Phil and I did about, okay, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it right. And we want to make sure that we're doing this by analysts for analysts. And we're not just building dashboards just for the sake of building dashboards. It's got to be real. It's got to be actionable. And you've got to be able to find bad guys with it. So I, I do want to thank Phil for all of his feedback there. And everybody else in our entire community who has played with technology previews one through three and has provided feedback, we certainly take that feedback very seriously and we try to incorporate that as much as possible. So let's talk a little bit about some goals. I said that uh, Phil and I had a lot of discussions about what do we want this thing to look like? What does it have to do? You know, Don this morning talked about goals and needs and features and how do you differentiate those things? And how do you make sure that you've defined your use cases and that you're satisfying those use cases? So a couple of goals that we had. Number one, require no prior knowledge of Elastic, right? Uh, because we have a lot of folks that have been using ELSA for a long, long time. And we want to try to make that migration from ELSA to Elastic as easy as possible. And kind of abstract away all of the nuts and bolts so that you don't have to be an expert in log stash configurations just to be able to get this thing up and running. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the hood of the car is not welded shut. We want you to be able to change your own oil and change your own spark plugs. So we want to make sure that we're exposing all of those knobs for tweaking and tuning to making sure that experienced users can customize the system to whatever extent they want to. So uh, Chris talked about pivoting quite a bit. So I, I told you we were going to talk some more about that. So integrations are, are very important to us. We're very much focused on making sure that folks can start in Seagull 
and pivot over to Kibana to say, hey, I've got an IDS alert here and I want to pivot and cast a wider net into Kibana and say, hey, show me all of my bro logs. Show me all of my syslogs. Show me all of my sysmon logs for this particular IP address. So pivoting whether that's seagull or squeal or squirt or whatever the case may be. And then once you're in Kibana, as your web interface for slicing and dicing your Elasticsearch logs, we want to be able to obviously pivot to full packet capture when the time comes to be able to do that. Dashboards. I've seen a lot of folks over the years building dashboards and they make some nice pretty pictures and that's great, but at the same time if we could make those nice pretty pictures actionable and actually usable by analysts to ask questions and get answers to those questions, that would be ideal. So we want to make it by analysts for analysts, uh, just like Squeal was designed by Bam Vischer, an, an incident responder from way back when. We want to make sure that we're taking all of our years of experience of hunting down bad guys and kind of exposing that uh, in these visualizations and dashboards that we're building. We want to make them interactive. So it's not just a dashboard that you're putting up on the big screen in your sock and it's just showing off for your dog and pony shows. We want to make it a dashboard that you as the analyst are actually interacting with. You're slicing and dicing within the dashboard and you're getting the data out uh, to make it actionable. And that's really the key at the end of the day. So requirements to do that, when I build a dashboard, I want to make sure that every single dashboard that I build in Kibana has a search panel at the very bottom. That search panel is going to expose the raw log entries. Because if I build a dashboard and it's just pretty pictures, well, that's pretty, but it's not necessarily actionable. But if I include a search panel at the bottom, and I'll show you this in the demo in a few minutes, then I can actually see the, the nitty gritty detail of all those logs. Uh, and I can sort of slice and dice among different fields and I can pivot over to full packet capture. And to do that, I'm going to expose in that search panel source IP and source port, destination IP and destination port, and the elastic ID. And this is gonna come in very important in a minute when we talk about pivoting from Kibana over to CapMe to go and get our full packet capture. We'll talk a little bit about workflow. We want to be able to be in Kibana, looking at our visualizations, looking at our dashboards, and we run across an IP of interest. We think maybe this is a victim IP address. Maybe it was some kind of a, a drive-by exploit, maybe whatever the case may be. We want to then pivot on that IP address and go and get as much information as we can, casting a wider net and saying, hey, Kibana, show me everything you know about this. So one of the things you'll notice is that we've taken fields of interest within Kibana and we've hyperlinked them. So for IP addresses, for host names, domain names, things like that, those kind of typical indicators, they're all hyperlinked. And anytime you see that hyperlink, you click on it, that takes you to a very special dashboard that we've built to do that kind of investigative work. That is going to be our indicator dashboard. Uh, and that's really going to expose what we consider to be the most important kinds of data that you would need to investigate a particular indicator. Now, once I'm kind of in that workflow of, of I'm, I'm hot on the trail of a bad guy and I'm chasing him down in my network and I've constructed all of these different uh, filters to really kind of narrow down my search, well, I've got some different dashboards and I'm, I might want to kind of keep my collection of filters and I might want to kind of switch over to another dashboard. Now this kind of tripped me up when I started uh, playing with Kibana, but what I realized pretty quickly was that, hey, you know what, a dashboard is really kind of like a lens that we look at, look through at the data. And so what I might want to do is kind of change my lens and kind of pivot from just looking at Maybe my DNS lens, I might want to pivot over to my HTTP lens, just like Chris was talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. So the idea here is that if I've, if I've already kind of created all these filters in Kibana, uh, I can pin those filters down, I can switch to another dashboard, and that's going to hold my filters in place, constraining that data set that's in the dashboard uh, to just those filters and that's gonna be a key part of my workflow. So keep in mind that whole concept of pinning those filters down. 
But wait, there's a problem. This is going to be a recurring theme throughout this presentation. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the problems that we've addressed uh, and how we tried to overcome those problems as we integrated uh, all of this elastic goodness. So I see your problem. There's a dude passed out in your engine. Also, your mechanic is a pony. So if your mechanic is a pony, you might have an authentication problem. And that's kind of what we have here. Because if you think about the pure open source Elastic Stack, there is no authentication whatsoever. If you go, in, uh, if you go with the Elastic XPack plugin, uh, then you can get some authentication, but that's not open source. We have to have open source. There are some open source plugins out there that provide some sort of authentication for Kibana, but it's kind of an unknown quantity. And really and truly, who wants yet another username and password, right? Ideally, we'd like to leverage our existing credentials to be able to then authenticate to Kibana. So, there are solutions. You know, if you mess up your Rubik's Cube, just repaint the darn thing. So in this case, we repainted our Rubik's Cube by writing our own Apache authentication proxy. Right? So this way, what we then wind up with is this nice uh, single sign-on web page hosted by Apache, which then becomes the front end not only for Kibana, but also for Squirt and also for CapMe, right? So if you remember back a couple of years ago, it used to be the case that you would have to like log into Elsa and then you would have to like log into CapMe. And if you remember back long before that, you would have to like authenticate to CapMe every single time, right? So we've made tremendous strides since then. Right? So you've already got a squeal username and password. Let's leverage that. Right? So anytime you try to log into Squirt or CapMe or Kibana now, it's going to prompt you for username and password that first time. You put in your squeal credentials, and you're good to go. But wait, there's another problem. You're going to hear this over and over and over again, and you're going to sing it along with me as we go. So get ready. <laughs> so... If you're an astronaut and you got this big honking helmet on your head and your nose starts itching, you can't get there from here. You know what I'm saying? We had the same kind of problem because we just talked about a minute ago the fact that we'd love to be able to go from Kibana and find an arbitrary log and be able to pivot over to CapMe. Now, in the abstract, that seems relatively simple, right? because we've been doing that from ELSA in the past. The way that works in ELSA is the get PCAP plugin, it scrapes off the source IP, source port, destination IP, and destination port. It then constructs a URL to pass that information over to CapMe, and it then goes behind the scenes and gets the PCAP for you and renders it. Now the problem here is that when we first started this whole technology preview process back in February, and we were running the Elastic Stack version 2, there was not an easy way to then scrape source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and construct a URL to get over to CapMe. You can do that with scripted fields in Elastic 5, but we didn't have that at the time. Plus, we came up with a better way anyway. So, the solution. Here it is. If the math teacher tells you to find x, you just circle it right there on the page. So in our case, finding x, solving the equation, uh, really had to do with a little bit of a rewrite of CapMe. So in this case, instead of having to feed all of these little pieces of information into CapMe, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, Let's let CapMe instead do the heavy lifting. 
So instead of passing four pieces of data to CatMe, let's just pass one piece of data, and that's going to be the Elastic ID. That's a unique identifier inside of the Elasticsearch database that says this is the unique identifier for this particular log entry. So now if we do that, if we pass that over to CatMe, CatMe can then go and query Elasticsearch and say, hey, Elasticsearch, give me all of the information for this particular log entry. Now the cool thing here is that if Elasticsearch comes back and says, hey, this is a con log, a bro con log, and it's got destination IP, destination port, uh, all of that information, and guess what? Our con logs have the sensor name on the very tail end of the log file. CatMe just scrapes the information off, and it goes and gets the full, full PCAP. All is right with the world. Now, if it's not a con log, let's say it's an HTTP log. Chris talked before about how bro has these unique identifiers, the bro uh, connection ID. And that's how bro logs can be correlated amongst each other. CatMe uses that and leverages that and says, okay, if this is bro HTTP, let's just strip out the connection ID, then go back to Elasticsearch. Hey, Elasticsearch, I need the con log for this connection. Once I've got the con log, then I can figure out what sensor I need to go and request the full packet capture from. All that to say, right, a few hundred lines of code and CatMe is now much more intelligent and can do all of this automatically without you having to think about it, right? And that's going to open up a whole other uh, window of possibilities there. So we're excited about that. But wait, there's another problem. Hey, Larry, stop cranking it. I think the engine's flooded. So if you're... I talked about this before, you know, we started off with uh, Ubuntu 1404, the original Elastic version 2, because that was the only thing that could run on OpenJDK 7. Now Elastic 5 has lots of new features, obviously we want to use the latest and greatest hotness, that required OpenJDK 8. So when people tell me, you're going to regret that in the morning, I sleep in until noon because I'm a problem solver. So in this case, Docker was our problem solver. Docker solved a whole lot of problems for us. So by packaging the Elastic Stack in Docker images, that kind of gets us around that whole sticky open JDK issue because we can build these little Docker images that are just a very minimal CentOS install, just enough to get open JDK 8 bootstrapped. And now we've got this nice abstraction layer so we can push these Docker images into place and we can run the latest version of Elastic Stack on our current version of Ubuntu 14.04. Plus, we get some nice security features out of it like process isolation and sandboxing and things like that. Pretty cool. But wait, there's another problem. So if you got one of these fancy new cars that has like, it's driven by a computer and it like updates firmware over the air, across the internet, and like some bad guy, like man in the middle is your car's LTE connection, like forces down bad firmware that says, if his GPS coordinates are at his house and he puts it into park, just go ahead and shove the foot on the gas and run through the garage door, right? That's a problem. So our problem here is Docker hub security, right? If we're gonna use Docker images if you think about what we've done with Ubuntu packages in the past, all of our Ubuntu packages are GPG signed to prevent tampering, right? So if somebody ever tries to man in the middle your downloads or, you know, is able to compromise one of the Ubuntu repos, your machine is not going to install those packages because they don't match the GPG signature. Now we want to make sure that we have that same level of security for our Docker images. So our solution here is the Docker notary. Now this is something that is kind of optional. It's not really turned on by default, uh, but what we do with all of our, our scripts, whenever they do a Docker pull, we make sure that we enforce this flag that's kind of counterintuitive, disable content trust equals false. It's kind of a double negative. It's not really good form, but that's our way of explicitly enabling uh, this whole concept of, number one, when we create a Docker image, I sign it with my GPG key. That's done through the Docker notary service. Uh, and then when we do a Docker pull, 
it's going to check and verify those signatures and make sure that they're correct. But wait, there's another problem. We need more power, right? Just like Tim Allen in that great old show, we want more power. So I want to be able to send automated emails. I want to define arbitrary criteria because maybe I'm not a 24 by 7 shop. Maybe I want my systems to be monitoring for certain things and letting me know when it sees that. I want to look for baby domains. Right? A lot of times bad guys are registering brand new domains. So I want to look for domain names that maybe were registered in the last month, the last week. I want to look for host names or domain names that have high entropy. Right? When those bad guys are doing domain generation algorithms and they're doing totally random looking domain names that look like a cat walked across the keyboard, right? I can measure that. I can look for entropy. But I want to do that on an automated basis. Also, I want endpoint end visibility in addition to my network visibility. So I got your power right here. So here's how we do those things. Elastalert is a great project which allows you to define arbitrary criteria and have that run on a scheduled basis, doing searches for whatever the heck you want, and then alerting via whatever service you want. And there's like 21 different plugins. You can do email and you can do Slack and all of the hipster chat channels these days. These kids in their whatevers. <laughs> yeah. uh, domain stats. I mentioned before Mark Baggett wrote this great Python script uh, called Domain Stats. And so this is going to essentially go and do a who is query on a domain name, look at that registration date, and then we can measure that. And we can write rules against that to say, hey, I want to look for any domains that maybe were registered in the last month, the last week, whatever. Likewise, freakserver.py, another Python script written by Mark Baggett, that does frequency analysis. So you take a DNS name or a host name, you run it through Freak Server, and it's going to give you a score. That score is going to indicate how random that name looks. And so we can now take every single DNS log, every single log that has any kind of a host name, we can run it through Freak Server, and we can very quickly, very easily get a score in every single one of our logs as they come in. They're automatically ingested with this frequency analysis score. That's pretty cool. Finally, endpoint visibility. Uh, we've heard a couple of folks talk today about Sysmon. I love Sysmon. I hope you do too. It's a great free tool from Mark Rosinovich of Microsoft fame. Uh, and it gives you great endpoint visibility. So we want to make sure that we are supporting folks deploying Sysmon, collecting those Sysmon logs. So we've got the parsers, we've got the, uh, the log stash config, the visualization, the dashboard, and auto runs as well. So great endpoint visibility there. But wait. There's another problem. Here's where things get interesting. You know, we really don't want just a single standalone box. We'd really like to do distributed deployments. We've been doing with this with Security Onion for a while. Right? You think about, we've been doing ELSA distributed deployments. You have a master server. You have sensors down here. And that's, in ELSA, that's a distributed database because each of your sensors had its own local ELSA instance. The ELSA web interface could then query all of those ELSA databases in parallel and return you the aggregate results from all of that. We'd like to do the same thing with the Elastic Stack. So let's talk about it. Well, you kind of got the traditional Elasticsearch clustering, which is very powerful. It's very cool. Uh, but it's really kind of chatty, right? Uh, and if you think about the way that that traditional clustering works, and if you were to try to overlay that on our kind of distributed, our traditional distributed deployment model, well then you may have a master server in your data center, and you may have a remote office on the other side of the world and a slow WAN link between the two, and if you try to do a traditional Elasticsearch cluster across that slow WAN link, you're probably going to have a bad day, right? because it's so chatty and requires so much back and forth. Now, Elastic came up with this thing called the Tribe Node, which is a little bit more lightweight. It's not doing the full replication across that WAN link, uh, but it's still fairly chatty. It still does a lot of communication between nodes, uh, very much unlike our traditional ELSA deployment, uh, where nodes were very much independent. Aha, 
Elastic recently came out with this brand new thing called Cross Cluster Search. That's their replacement for the Tribe node. Cross Cluster Search enables you to do a much more lightweight and less chatty connection to remote nodes. Pretty cool. But wait, there's another problem. Okay, so if we go with this whole cross search cluster thing, we're gonna have a master server here. We're gonna have sensors down here. We want our master server to query our sensors down here. But remember before I said that the open source Elastic Stack by default has no authentication and there's no encryption. So if a master server just goes and queries across the network, by default, that's unencrypted. We, we really don't want to be sending that stuff unencrypted across the network. We really kind of need some encryption. So let's think about the way we did it in ELSA. With ELSA, we used SSH tunnels to encrypt all of that communication. All right, so ELSA master server says, OK, I need to connect to this sensor down here. So I'm going to connect to localhost port 50,000. That's my first sensor. And that's a port that gets forwarded across the SSH tunnel down to the sensor down here. So now master server sends a request, sensor responds, master server gets the data. Okay, well let's just do the same thing with Elasticsearch. <laughs> but wait, there's another problem. All right, this is where things get complicated. Okay, because localhost is not necessarily localhost. Wait, what did you just say? Yeah, when Docker comes into play, you don't just have one local host anymore, right? Because local host from the perspective of the Docker container is different than local host of the host OS itself, right? So if Elasticsearch tries to connect to local host port 50,000, that's local host port 50,000 inside of the little Docker image, the Docker container. All right, so my SSH tunnel that is doing that port 50,000 port forward, those things just aren't even talking to each other, okay? So I was racking my head with this. How are we going to make these things, make the connection? How are we gonna make this work? So as it turns out, there's this internal Docker interface, uh, and by default, at least on my machines, it's 172.18.0.1. So when we configure our SSH tunnel, we'll just add some extra syntax to say, okay, instead of connecting that SSH tunnel to port 50,000 on local host, we'll connect it to 172.18.0.1. That's that Docker interface that Elasticsearch inside the Docker container can connect to uh, and ultimately get across the SSH tunnel. But wait, there's another problem. The problem is, if we want to do that extra syntax, SSH doesn't want to let us do that. So we have to reconfigure SSH to allow that. But we don't want to do it globally across the board. We don't want to open up huge security holes. So we have to make sure that we very granularly limit that to just the SSH tunnel and the user account associated with that auto SSH tunnel. OK, cool. Got it. But wait, there's another problem. All right, so we got a master server. We got a sensor. We got an SSH tunnel connecting the two. And in terms of TCP IP, we have a connection. Port 50,000 is flowing across the SSH tunnel. All should be good with the world. However, the second that Elasticsearch up here tries to talk to Elasticsearch down here, Elasticsearch down here says, you know, you actually should be talking to this IP address and this port. So it's kind of a redirect that goes the wrong direction. So, okay, fine. Let's just reconfigure Elasticsearch on the sensor to give it the proper IP address and port using the transport publish host and transport publish port syntax. Whew. Are you exhausted as I am? All right. So now we've got the plumbing in place. We have TCP IP in place. We can do the whole three-way handshake thing and we can actually do an elastic query. Now we just need to have the sensor tell the master server, hi, I'm a new sensor. I want, to, I want you to add me to your list of sensors to query. So 
If you are familiar with Elasticsearch, you know you can do a get, you can do a put to change settings. So we have the sensor do a put to underscore cluster slash settings to add the new host name, IP address, and port, and all is right with the world. Now, that's your first sensor. You probably want to add more. <laughs> the plot thickens, okay? So now your second sensor is going to say, hi, I'm sensor number two. I'd like to join your cross cluster search. So it does a get to cluster settings. It says, here's the list of existing sensors. It finds the highest number port, which at this point is 50,000. So we increment that. Sensor number two is then going to be port 50,001. Additional sensors then continue incrementing, so each sensor has its own port. That's the same basic methodology that we had in place for ELSA. Uh, we just had to fix all of that plumbing stuff that I explained on the last 27 or so slides. Hey, look, yes, that was all undocumented. <sighs> all of that was undocumented. Uh, it, was, it was me just running into stuff with trial and error, right? Okay. Questions or comments so far? Would you like to see a demo? Well, the, uh, yeah, I'm pushing my luck here because, um, and that's why you see the flames down here, right? So. Uh, oh, so you were the sacrifice. Okay, okay, well, I appreciate that, I do. Uh, let me give some caveats here. Okay, so we've already had one fail. We had a, a projector and podium fail. Uh, this is a relatively new laptop, and this is only my second time doing a public demo. I have three virtual machines running, each with eight gigs of RAM, uh, and this is all brand new stuff. The cross-cluster search stuff is considered beta by the Elastic folks, uh, and all of our integration stuff is still considered pre-alpha at this point. So. That's all my excuses. We could go down in a blaze of glory. Are you ready? Buckle up. I need some liquid courage. All right. Oh, uh, in addition to getting a new laptop, I switched from Mac OS to Windows. See, with, with Mac only offering 16 gigs of RAM on a laptop, I had to leave. I'm sorry, Joel, I'm sorry. I know, I, Joel gives me the thumbs down. I know, I know. 16 gigs of RAM is just not sufficient. All right, excuse me. So, here we go. We've got a, uh, a master server here. 530,000 logs. That's kind of visible. Uh, let's see. So let me show you this first. So I've got these two sensors here. I'll just very quickly show you. Uh, this guy's got 8 gigs of RAM. It's got our whole standard security onion stack plus the Elastic stack running. You can see there it's got its own Elastic search instance. And then of course sensor 2 is going to basically be identical. Same thing there. Standard sniffing stuff, standard Elastic search stuff. So master server has its own Elasticsearch database. Sensor 1 has its own Elasticsearch. Sensor 2 has its own Elasticsearch. They're all independent, but yet they're joined via cross-cluster search, which allows us to query all of them in parallel and get results aggregated across the entire sensor population. All right, so just to prove that to you, let me go down here to stats. So let me see if I can do a little zoomage here. So if you can see there, we've got master ETH1, and it's got 21,000 logs. We've got sensor 1 ETH1, that's 21,000 logs, and sensor 2, 21,000 logs. So cross-cluster, all of that plumbing stuff I just talked about, it's working. It's amazing. All right, so let's see. What else can we do here? Let's kind of talk about number one, if I can zoom back out and then go here. So just a little bit of kind of workflow navigation type stuff. Uh, if you've played with our previous technology previews, uh, one of the things that's changing as of today is that the link to Squirt 
and the link for logout, those are now located on the sidebar here. Right? And you'll, you'll be able to see here that when I go over to Squirt, I don't have to authenticate to Squirt because of single sign-on. Right? So if I'm already authenticated to Gabbana, I can instantly and easily pivot to Squirt and do what I need to do there. Uh, now, while I'm in Squirt, let me actually do this. So I'll just do a search here, and I'll just rewind this back to, say, 2016, just to get a whole bunch of data. And then maybe I start doing an investigation here, Chris Sanders style. Maybe I look into an alert. Maybe I find an interesting IP address. Maybe I want to pivot on that IP address. And so maybe I go down to this list, and I look for Kibana. That's going to pivot over to our indicator dashboard. Notice I didn't have to authenticate, right? Uh, and so here, I'm on my indicator dashboard, and here we kind of expose what we consider to be the most important kinds of data for that particular indicator. So we've got kind of the overview of the different kinds of logs, from snort alerts to HTTP logs to connection logs. Uh, we've got our IDS alerts listed here. We can scroll down the page. We get like uh, source IP, destination IP, HTTP sites, sites hosting EXEs, so we can tell instantly this is actually a, a Windows EXE coming from Windows Update, right? So in your triage process, this makes it very easily to go from an IDS alert and say, was this malicious or was this legitimate? Well, this is probably legitimate, depending on your view of Microsoft's legitimacy. So. Now, this is what I was talking about before in that all of our dashboards include a search panel at the bottom. You can see the search panel listed here, and we expose the most interesting fields uh, in that search panel. So source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, UID, and underscore ID. Now, so let's talk about Chris is, Chris's idea of pivoting, right, and data expansion, data reduction, right, because I might then kind of pivot from Squirt to here to Kibana, and now I've done some data expansion, right? I've got some additional data. I've casted a wider net, and I now have some more uh, potential victims to go on, maybe some additional attacker IP space that I might need to investigate. Notice all of these are hyperlinked. So if I then take a look at this IP address, I can just click on it. That's going to spawn another Kibana tab going again to our indicator dashboard, focusing on that particular IP address. All right, so let me also show you the fact that uh, this UID is hyperlinked, so that's the bro unique identifier, that's the connection ID. So if I wanna see all of those bro logs kind of uh, at the same time for that particular connection ID, I just click on that and I see that I've got HTTP, con, and files. Now final, finally, this hyperlink here for underscore ID, that's the very special ID field that I talked about before, and that's our very special hyperlink into CAPME. So when you see underscore ID, think full packet capture. So let's just see if this will work for us. We pivot over to CAPME, again, not having to authenticate, and this may actually take a few seconds due to internet. It's probably trying to do a DNS lookup. Normally, if my internet connection was up, this should happen pretty fast. Hey, there it goes. So there's our full packet capture. All of that 30 seconds was, was really it just trying to resolve this IP address here. Uh, otherwise, it would be instantaneous. So again, you're able to very quickly and easily pivot not only from one interface to another, not only from Squirt to Kibana to CatMe, but pivot from multiple data types, multiple data sources, just like Chris was talking about. So let me quickly kind of talk about some of our menus over here. I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, but I'm gonna pick a few highlights. Uh, you'll recognize a lot of these if you've used ELSA in the past. You'll, you'll remember on ELSA, we have that sort of list of canned queries on the left-hand side. A lot of these came from there kind of taking those standard bro logs like the connection log, the DNS log, the HTTP log. And so for each of those kind of log types, we build a dashboard. On that dashboard, we include visualizations for the most interesting fields for that particular data type. So let me just show you a few examples here. Bro notices, right? So uh, this is somewhat analogous to an alert. So this is included under alert data. So this is where you see uh, things like the Team Cymru malware hash registry matches. That's always good fun there. 
you can see on this dashboard we've exposed the most interesting fields from that bro notice log. And of course, the underscore ID field allows you to pivot even from bro notices uh, or other logs which may not necessarily have that kind of tuple of information that I talked about before, uh, source IP import, destination IP import. Catme has the intelligence to go and find that full packet capture for you. A last alert, I mentioned this before, this is uh, the method that you can use to kind of define arbitrary criteria to say, hey, I want you to go and search for this thing, this thing, and this thing, and if you ever find it, I want it to, to email it to me, or page me, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and we do have a dashboard for that, so you can kind of build your own visualizations there. Of course, we do have a dashboard for network-based IDS alerts. Uh, so you see all of your lovely snort alerts here. You can slice and dice those to your heart's content. Uh, all kinds of nice hyperlinked fields for additional analysis. Let's see, I definitely want to show you DNS. Uh, because one of the things I talked about was uh, Mark's Python scripts for freak server and domain stats, right? And this is going to be some, some next level hunting capabilities. Uh, because if I scroll down here, you see kind of the typical DNS stuff. But then when we get into highest registered domain frequency analysis, let me zoom into this because this is important. Notice uh, most of these names look pretty interesting, wouldn't you say? Right, so when all of these logs are coming in, Logstash is saying, oh, that's a host name, that's a DNS name. I need to go and look at, I need to run that through Freak Server and I need to run that through Domain Stats, and I need to get these frequency scores, and that's gonna help me find these sort of random looking host names. Uh, and I can tell you that about 90% of these names listed here are domain generation algorithms, right? That's pure concentrated evil, okay? And this gives us a very easy way of finding that stuff. All right, so let's see if we can zoom back out. We have the same thing for parent domains. We have highest registered domain and parent domain. Uh, so Mark created the Python scripts. Justin Henderson created the Docker images, which uh, house those Python scripts. Then we also have this here, so that domainstats.py, it enables us to look for baby domains, right? So notice admin A offline was created August the 25th of 2017, right? So when a bad guy goes and registers brand new domain names, whether it's domain generation algorithm or whatever the case may be, we can find that very quickly and easily here. All right, so zoom back out. Scroll back up. Let's see, what else do I want to show you? Let me look at my cheat sheet here. Uh, we talked about pivoting to Catme, Elastalert, hunting, DNS, HTTP, uh, SSL. So SSL certificates, they do that same kind of scoring of host names using frequency analysis and, and entropy and things like that. Uh, SMB. So. If you're, a, uh, if you're a hardcore Bro user, you know that the current version of Bro does have experimental SMB traffic analysis, so you can kind of monitor your Windows file sharing traffic. And we have the log stash parsers in place to parse all of that experimental Bro SMB logs. There's four different logs that, that encompasses. We parse all of those, we create the visualizations and the dashboards, all that's there for your hunting pleasure. All right, so that's SMB, go out. Uh, and endpoint visibility, one more thing and then we're done. So let's see, host hunting. I mentioned before Sysman, Sysmon, I love Sysmon. Uh, let's see if I go to last seven days. Hey, I've got data. So I built a little uh, Windows 10 VM, I installed Sysmon, I started collecting those logs, uh, and we consume all those, we ingest those into Logstash, we give you some visualizations. So here you can see, I've got some nice host visibility here. I can see EXEs executing on my endpoints, right? So we all kind of realize as security practitioners that more and more of our network traffic is being encrypted, so 
we then need to make sure that we're filling in the gaps in our analysis by giving ourselves that endpoint telemetry. Sysmon's a great way to do that, uh, and we fully support that here. All right, so very good uh, endpoint telemetry there. Very excited about that. Oh, and one more thing. So let me show you, just so you can kind of see a little bit of the plumbing behind the scenes. Uh, this is what I was talking about before, relating to kind of the plumbing of cross-cluster search and how we send that traffic over the SSH tunnel, right? So you've got your master server here. It communicates with itself. And then it communicates with sensor 1 over 172.18.01, port 50,000. And then sensor 2 over port 50,001. All that's SSH. It's all encrypted. Uh, it's all good to go. All right. Did that demo actually work? <laughs> it's amazing. Yes. Thank you, kind sir. Thank you. All right, let me go back into full screen mode. Not from beginning. Why did you do that? Computers are hard. The demo was the hard part. The slides are even harder. We're almost there. There's another problem. Yeah, there's another problem. There sure is. Hey, all in all, this is our best hunting platform ever. Uh, we're very excited, we've worked very hard, but wait, there's another problem. Feedback, yeah, we need it, okay? So uh, we have gotten a good amount of feedback based on technology preview one, technology preview two, technology preview three. No pool, no problem. Hey, just fill up the trash can with some water. There's your swimming pool right there. Hey, you know what? You guys, you've got trash cans. You've got your own networks, right? You can, you can fill that up with some water. You can, you, can, you can play with the Elastic Stack Alpha because it's available today. We are now at alpha release. Uh, if you take a look at our blog, blog.securityonion.net, at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, the alpha release went live. So you can play with this today. All the latest and greatest stuff that I just demoed, all the visualizations, all the dashboards, all the logs dash parsers, all the cross-cluster search, all the distributed deployment, you can do all of this today. And, Joel, one more thing. It's all available in an ISO image. So 1404.5.3. Available today. This is our very first ISO image containing the elastic stack. Again, I need to emphasize this is the alpha release. Do not, I repeat, do not deploy this in production, okay? But if you can deploy it in semi-quasi-production, kind of off to the side of your existing production sensor, and you can feed it some copies of your production traffic, and you can give us some feedback on that, that would be amazing. So download the ISO image, uh, play with it, give us your feedback. You can go to blog.securityonion.net. You can send your feedback to our mailing list. Uh, we monitor that every single day. Uh, we're very much interested in feedback. Uh, especially on this alpha release, help us get to beta. We want to get there and we want to get there fast, but we need your help to do so. Your next question is going to be about timeline, and so I'm going to preempt your question by answering it right now. Okay? So we want to get this released by the end of the year, if possible, maybe early 2018 if we have an issue. Okay? But again, we need your help to do so. If, if you guys don't play with it and you don't give us your feedback, then we're not going to get there, right? But if you can help us out, provide feedback, that's going to help us get there much, much faster. Now, this is very important to note. Once we reach that full final release of the Elastic Stack, there's going to be a six-month timer, 
and Elsa is going to go end of life in six months, okay, because we can't support both forever. So get ready, right, if you're running Elsa in production today, you're going to need to migrate to the elastic stack uh, before we hit that six month end of life. All right, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have a couple of events. Tomorrow, who's going to B-Sides Augusta? Should be everybody. Yes, absolutely. So we're very excited about B-Sides Augusta. Hope to see you there. Security Onion Solutions will have a vendor table set up there. And we will bring back Onion Arcade. Folks seemed to like it last year. So we'll be back again this year. And it might be version 2.0. Not going to tell you what that means. You're going to have to stop by and find out what it's all about. We have a four-day basic class coming up in San Antonio. That's in November. Registration is open now. We may have a four-day advanced class, maybe the very first public advanced class ever, uh, which might be in late 2017 or early 2018. So stay tuned for further announcements about that. If you're interested in training at your own facility, we do go on-site and do training classes with an age student minimum. So reach out to us if you're interested in that. You can find more information at securityonionsolutions.com. Calm. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much. We made it through the demo. We didn't go down in a blaze of glory. Questions or comments? Okay. Brant. The ISO image already includes the Docker images. Yes. So you can just download the ISO image. You can just run setup as you always have. You'll see a new option inside of setup, which will ask you if you want to run stable setup or experimental setup. You run experimental setup, and it will give you all of the elastic goodness using the Docker images that are already built into that ISO image. One more question. Yes, sir, Mr. Kevin. So currently out of the box, you're only going to have Kibana on the master server. So just like we've always done with Elsa, you just have the Elsa web interface on the master server itself. So if you were to look at my sensor one and sensor two, Kibana is not running at all. Now, it is possible in theory, because I know where you're going, I, I know your use case, it is possible to run Kibana on that sensor uh, and have it looking at its own local Elasticsearch. So that is possible. Um, get with me for more information. That's not, that's not a use case that everybody does, but in theory, it's possible. All right, so I think we are out of time. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you yet again to all of our sponsors, all of our speakers, and to each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. Hope to see you tomorrow, and hope to see you again next year. Thank you.